Hey everybody, welcome into our brand new weekly NBA betting show here presented by sportsbet.io. Pumped for the season. It's already here to get underway and we'll be with you here each and every week to break down all the biggest storylines going on throughout the league, talk about the best individual games on the card. And to do that, I've got my pal Chris Farley with me, who you've seen already on our NFL show. Him and Lou Finicaro doing an awesome job already every single week on the sportsbet.io YouTube channel. And uh, I'm Ben Wilson. Chris and I, we've uh, we've gotten to work together here in the sports betting space. Chris, an awesome professional better who I've learned so much from through NBA, WNBA, NFL as well. And uh, Chris, here we go, man. We're already we're already rolling. We've already got guys banged up and injured. What's new in this league? We, we love to bet on and, uh, and love to, to sometimes uh, loathe ourselves for betting on the NBA. Yeah, man. Great to be with you again here. Uh, you know, I know I really enjoy the NFL show, Lou Finnecaro. Also great to kind of not be the host. Just sit back, let you do the gig, Ben Wilson. You're very good at it. Obviously, this is what you do for a living. Um, yeah, man. It's We were talking about it before the show, right? It's We're closing in on the sports equinox. There is a lot going on right now. And I know that I am very heavily into the NFL always, uh, you know, through the entire NFL season. But you do have to make some some adjustments in your schedule as you approach the NBA season, especially the way that the NBA is, right? There's so many transactions in the offseason, major players switching teams, you know, a, a lot of injuries sometimes they incur at the start of the season as maybe they don't give their bodies enough time to rest. Uh, so both personally and looking at the guys professionally, a lot to adjust to. I guarantee you, Ben, I will forget some names on this show. I'll screw up some names on this show. Uh, but, you know, we'll get there. And I, I always approach the NBA with a very cautious, um, uh, you know, attitude because it, it, it is a just as zany as the NFL, especially in those first few months as some of these teams like start to work in their chemistry and their continuity. I totally feel the same way. As far as how I approach it, I'm definitely going to go heavier on win totals earlier on, try to look at some longer term positions just because the volatility early on, especially in the betting markets. We'll talk about it in a couple of games, Chris, you and I are betting, but I, I generally tread lightly. I only have a one bet in pocket so far for the opening couple game, couple days of games, which we'll talk about. Season starts Tuesday next week, a full slate of games on Wednesday as well. It, you can easily drive yourself insane going way too heavy on the bankroll early. And and you mentioned, too, all the other sports going on. That's another uh, good thing to keep in mind. But that's what we're here to do. We're kind of here to get everybody caught up to speed on what the biggest storylines are going on in the NBA. As far as just the overall scale here, Chris, of each conference, if we start in the East, it's interesting how you have Boston, New York, Philadelphia, all in the same division. Yep. And they're the three favorites to win the East. Boston looking to run it back as they are the favorites at a very short plus money price to win the East. As far as where the market's at, at least coming into the year, do you feel like it's fair where Boston is at? Is the gap appropriate right now between them, those two behind them, as well as Milwaukee? Those are kind of the four right now uh, who are at least giving chase to Boston as we get this season underway. Yeah, you know, I do think it's fair. And, you know, that's unfortunate because I've been sort of talking against the Boston Celtics for a long time in there. Uh, lack of fulfilling their true potential every season. But at this point, I mentioned continuity, and continuity is so important in the NBA, and you just don't see it with a lot of teams, right? Like even a team like the Milwaukee Bucks, who year after year, season after season, seemed like the same team. Then they start to incur some injuries, and now they're kind of different in a lot of ways, right? Boston Celtics are not. I mean, they, you know, a few offseason moves, but for the most part, this is the same team. It's the same starting five that should be. Excellent. Uh, they finally got over the hump. And I think it's a big deal that Jason Tatum doesn't have to be the man all the time. Right. I mean, I, you know, in the in the fourth quarter, people think that I'm ragging on him. Maybe when I talk about him like this, but he's not he's not always that present. Right. But they have a lot of veterans on the team who can step up. Uh, the, you know, the depth is second to none still at this point. I'll tell you, I'll say this, Ben. I, I want to like the New York Knicks. You know, I'm a, I'm a New York Giants fan in the NFL. I'm not officially a Knicks fan, but. Uh, I, I loved watching the Knicks kind of come up on their end, uh, but I, I'm just not a Carl Anthony Towns guy. I don't know how he's really going to fit into that equation. Like I'd probably rather have Mitchell Robinson out there, you know, as soon as he's healthy with them. Uh, but, you know, the addition of Mikel Bridges, uh, you know, OG Ananobi, who they brought over last year, they got Cameron Payne now who's going to run the floor very fast. It's a very interesting team. I don't know if it's as defensive as it used to be, but I, I think their offense has certainly improved. And we'll see what version of Carl Anthony Towns we get, right? Uh, and then as far as the 76ers go, I don't know, man. It's, you know, when you got a guy like Paul George who comes over, 
who I, I know he's a great player, but I'm not sure how much of an effect, an immediate effect he's going to have on their team. I thought they were fine kind of keeping their core unit together. But so there's some transitions going on there too, right? And Paul George has moved around a lot in his career and it hasn't always amounted to success in the teams that he's with. So uh, I think Boston deserves it. But once again, Eastern Conference, very, very interesting uh, as always. And it should be a fight until the end. And you laid out exactly why it's really hard to, when you can poke holes in the three main teams who are viewed to be contenders to potentially take down Boston, talk about it for New York and Philadelphia, Milwaukee, the oldest roster by far in the league. I mean, it is, I mean, you're sitting there, everybody's pretty much eligible for their ARP card over there in, in Milwaukee. And I, I, I'm from Milwaukee originally, uh, for the most part, outside of really one season of my life, of, uh, of over three decades, Jeez, but a self-hating Bucks fan. And it's one of those things you wonder, is this kind of the last part of the window for Milwaukee? Uh, they're the fourth favorite on the odds board, 6-1 to one to win the East, Philly 450, Knicks about 4-1. to one. Do I want to hold a, a Celtics ticket, though, at around plus 150 in pocket all year? No, but it, it's hard for me to truly get excited at those other numbers, at least for right now. And and that's kind of the East in a nutshell. I mean, as, as much as you know, Miami and Orlando have a fascinating battle to duke it out in the Southeast Division, those aren't really true contenders right now at 20 to 1, 25 to 1 long shots, respectively. Uh, and that's sort of it. It's, it's sort of weird to go into a season where you kind of know who the top four are going to be, but it, like there's so many different paths it could turn out to. And we're going to talk about that with Philly, Milwaukee specifically in a little bit, Chris, because that is one of the uh, the opening night matchups that we'll have on Wednesday and one that we're already seeing some big market movement uh, with a lot of the injuries. Speaking of injuries, though, want to go to the Western Conference as well because, uh, shocker, Kawhi Leonard is already hurt, uh, Chris. I mean, who could have thought no. that would possibly happen? But that is really torpedoed the win total market. If you go to the Pacific Division, uh, good on you if you got a Clippers under 42 and a half when those win totals were posted because I'm seeing – I saw some you know, really respected betters, uh, Chris, out there giving out under 39 and a half, 38 and a half. This is down to 35 and a half. So really no way you could bet a win total now on the Clippers. But with Kawhi Leonard now out indefinitely, that report coming out a couple days ago, uh, kind of throwing this uh, this division now, you feel like the Clippers are surely the long shot. And uh, we have a couple teams I think we're both really intrigued in backing this year. Uh, you, Golden State, me, Phoenix, which we'll get into right now. But uh, one of the few divisions here where the favorite is plus money to win the respective division. And you could make a case for a couple different teams here. Yeah, the Golden State Warriors, I'll just speak to them first. I, I do have an over ticket on them. Um, and... I, you know, I, I don't think the Warriors are a very popular grab right now, and I, I, I fully understand that, right? I mean, they haven't uh, fulfilled their potential either, a lot of injuries, and now maybe their biggest transition in a long time, right? Because Clay Thompson is not a part of that team anymore, moved on from that historic unit. Uh, but I think at this point, Clay is kind of dead weight. You know, the movement wasn't there as much, the explosiveness wasn't. I mean, that's, you know, it's just what happened when you have the kind of injuries that he had. But now Steve Kerr, who we know is an excellent coach. I mean, he has his critics too, but he, he's been around for a long time for a reason, multiple championships, obviously. He's been working on this young unit, this young core of the Warriors for such a long time. And I think this is finally the year where they start to come together and we start to actually see the benefit of all that work that he's done, right? I mean, he, he's taken out Steph Curry in the regular season, right? He's taken out some players where we're like, what is he doing? Well, he's trying to develop these guys. And now you got a guy like Jonathan Kaminga, right? Uh, I mean, they got, you know, the depth on the roster now is much better. I mean, they bring over Buddy Heald, you know, Gary Payton the second, maybe he can actually be healthy for a full year, right? Kevon Looney has worked on his game. DeAnthony Melton's over there. And I kind of like that Steph Curry and Draymond can work together as like a one-two punch. They, you know, they have their star in Steph Curry, who has always been so humble, right? When Kevin Durant came over, he kind of took a back seat. He gets to shine now a little bit more than usual. And, I, and I, I love that for this team, too, a team that not a lot of people are thinking about or expecting to be that successful this year. But now the continuity is actually there and they added some great depth pieces. So I think the Warriors are going to be pretty feisty again this year that, you know, obviously got booted out of the play in tournament last season. So they they have some vengeance on their mind and they're not done quite yet. It's like, when's the last time Golden State came into a season just totally under the radar like you're talking yeah. about? I mean, 43 and a half win total or 20 to 1 to win the West, 4 to 1 to win the Pacific Division. I, I would love to see, too, I, I have to do some more shopping on this since we've got a few days till the season starts. There are a lot of different markets to get out there, but you know, Lakers are sitting there, too, at 43 and a half. They've already seen a lot of under money come in on their win total. Let's move a couple wins now uh, down on a Laker team that still is LeBron, AD, and then... Who really knows? And, and there's just not much depth behind him. 
Like you could find like a Golden State, you know, head-to-head wins matchup over the Lakers. You're really telling me th- th- that roster construction and the lack of depth that the Lakers have. You're telling me those teams are t- completely even from a win total perspective. That that, that kind of tells it right in a nutshell that the market is sort of sleeping on Golden State, a team that was about 500 against the number last year and is obviously doing a lot of reshuffling, like you talked about. Yeah, 100. percent And a team like the Lakers, you bring them up. Uh, I gotta say, they depended way too much on LeBron James again last season, right? Like we're kind of waiting every single year for that to happen a little bit less. And it just doesn't. And I, you know, I, I have a son uh, having my own son on my like own professional team. I can't imagine how cool that is, but I, but I also can't imagine that that's not going to emotionally mess with him a little bit. Um, yeah. The Lakers are just a team that I've been trying to fade for a long time and they start really slow. I mean, the past few seasons, we could talk about their game uh, coming up in the opener, but the past few seasons, Ben, they have started very slow and they take a long time to kind of make it all work. And then they start to surge late in the season, right? I wouldn't be surprised if we don't get that late late season surge as much this season, just because LeBron James at a certain point, he's a human being and Anthony Davis has not stepped up and taken the reins as much as he needs to. Plus he's so, he's so injury prone, right? I mean, the guy falls every other play. Uh, So I'm not, I'm not very high on the Lakers. Can't be high on the Clippers hearing about what happened with Kawhi, and it is no surprise that he's injured again. I mean, it's very disappointing because I think he is one of the best players in the world. Yeah, no doubt. But, uh, yeah, you know, I think the West is also wide open. I know you like the Suns. I kind of hate the Suns, but that's only because I hate all the personalities that have to work together over there. I know. Devin Booker, I, you know, I just think he doesn't quite do enough for that team. They need to funnel it to Kevin Durant as much as they can. But, again, injuries and lack of continuity, including – Bradley Beal have really affected them as well. So the West is wide open, Ben. I, I kind of like Denver, but you're not getting a great price on that either. Yeah, sure thing. You look at the favorites right now, generally in the West, OKC, it also feels like everybody's on yeah. plus 310. They were the team that really took the leap last year. Feels like everybody's on them, a, a team that at least value-wise, there's nothing there right now, just over 3-1 to one to win the conference. Uh, Denver plus 475 right now, along with Dallas, Minnesota in the 5-1 to one range. I do... Yeah, Phoenix, I have no idea how they'll actually match up against these elite teams in a full best of seven playoff series. Like, I, I don't know that I'd really want to invest in Phoenix right now long term, but as far as in the playoffs, but like a division bet plus 155, you know, we're talking about Lakers and Clippers teams we're down on. I'm not totally sold on the DeMar DeRozan integration in Sacramento, who's the second favorite. I do think Golden State, as we talked about, I do like your play there, Chris, on the over 43 and a half. But I did go ahead and play an over 47 and a half on Phoenix. That has moved about a win to the over. I guess my only fear is that it feels like that is a very popular bet coming into this year. But look, I've watched a lot of Mike Budenholzer coach teams. Yeah. And while they tend to struggle in best of seven playoff series, struggle with adjustments you know, in series, he is a really damn good regular season coach. You're talking about a guy who's won – what, 50 plus games, five of the 10 years he's been a head coach uh, and has done it in, in Atlanta, in Milwaukee, turning those teams around. Obviously helps. He had a guy named Giannis Antetokounmpo, but I really expect him coming in, back to, in his home state, by the way, in, in uh, Arizona, really will increase the amount of three-point shooting that, that that team takes. And it was a group that they relied, I thought, way too heavily on the mid-range last year. They were you know, a top five volume uh, mid-range team. They made a lot of those shots, but when you've got you know lead outside shooters, you got a Bradley Beal, a Kevin Durant, a Devin Booker. I think a lot of what you talk about, why you you kind of hated this Phoenix team, Chris, is because of the lack of distribution. And yep. Phoenix went out and got a Tyus Jones at point guard, who was one of the best assist to turnover ratio guys in the league last year, and also Monte Morris, who was actually number one in, in the league in assisted turnovers. Uh, that to me just feel I feel like that'll allow their stars. You get the Beal, Booker, and uh, and uh, you know and Durant trio just to find themselves to be optimized for better shot quality. Uh, and that's more than anything why I do like Phoenix here is that 47 and a half. I get the schedule is tough. You got uh, 16 back-to-backs this year, rest advantage and the, a slight negative for them. But, I mean, look, B- Bud, Bud wins games in the regular season, man. If you really want to simplify the handicap, that's it for Phoenix. Yeah, you know, and I didn't mean to dog your play on Phoenix. I mean, I must say you're exactly right. This is a team built to win in the regular season. Uh, you know, as long as they stay healthy, and it's a great point about Tyus Jones, too. You know, uh, finally someone who can distribute the ball other than Devin Booker, right? Who, who actually did a pretty good job at point guard last year. But he's a much better player when he can just kind of move to the outside, spot shoot, and, you know, create some, create some baskets for other people beyond that. Uh, but, yeah, but this Suns team is absolutely built to win in the regular season. Once it comes playoff time, 
you know, maybe they lack a little bit of depth. I know some people say you don't need that in the playoffs, but it, you know, it turns out in some moments you do, right. Just to kind of bail out some of those starters. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't like the lack of chemistry that I've seen in some of those tense moments, but Phoenix is a team that 75% of the league, they should annihilate them, right. With the kind of scores that they have on the court every single night. So, uh, I, I do, I, you know, I'm not against that play regular season, but for sure, for sure. said long-term playoffs or like pivotal games, that's a team I love to fade. I mean, they were one of the worst teams, you know, in clutch situations last year. Twenty third in crunch time offense, second worst net rating in the fourth quarter. Like they were, they were, they were double uh, the like the amount of uh, futility in the fourth quarter. They were a negative eleven point six net rating in the fourth quarter. Miami was twenty ninth last year, and they were negative five and a half. So think about that. <laughs> like, how is it possible with that group right. that Phoenix could be twice as worse as the second worst team in the league in fourth quarter rating? So that's where a lot of that comes in for me, Chris. It's just a positive regression for a team that still won 49 games last year, despite being 39, 40, 35, 49 and two against the number. And uh, you're talking about a win total reduced by two games. Uh, so yeah, bet on regular season. Don't totally invest for the futures. Uh, Phoenix and Golden State in that division. We do like uh, as far as a couple other rapid fire uh, win totals, Chris, we'll go to a couple teams who are not really viewed to be contenders whatsoever, but uh, in the Eastern conference, Toronto team, you've got your eye on this year. Yeah, I'm not going to try to pronounce the coach's last name because I always get a bad, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> uh, but Darko, I like Darko a lot. You know, he comes from like the Euro League and Serbia and all that. He came over to the NBA uh, about a decade ago and played in the G League a lot. Well, coached in the G League, uh, and you know now he's getting his run or his. I think this is his third, second or third season with the Raptors, um, and and now we're finally seeing some continuity here, right? Uh, you know, they had that trade last year. They brought in R.J. Barrett. Uh, RJ Barrett, I think is in a much better spot for this team, right? I, I don't think he dealt well with the pressure that was on him right away, especially in that big media market of New York. And when you had Jakob Podol, Scotty Barnes, RJ Barrett, and quickly on the, on the court last season, they were outscoring opponents by 11 points per 100 possessions. I mean, that's a legitimate metric for a team that might actually have a decent starting five. Now, the Grady Dick is a a player or two at a uh, shooting guard who is shooting nearly 40% from three point land in the final three months. So they're coming together as a team. I like some of the depth pieces that they brought over too. you got to love Bruce Brown who could just do it all for any team, you know, Davion Mitchell guys like that. And I think they drafted really well too. I mean, they got some guys some bigger guys who can come in and make a difference. You know, the last player left on that championship Raptors team is Chris Bosher. Bosher is that how you say uh Boucher. Yeah. Boucher, I always Boucher, get his name Boucher, on this yeah, stuff too. But you know, a lot, you've a lot of, we have a lot of foreign <laughs> names on this Toronto. Yeah, team, this uh, is in fairness. You know, yes. but it's a different operation now, and their win total is just so low, 29 and a half. I know they're in a very tough division, right? But uh this is a team who I think can beat up on a lot of bad teams this season, and I don't think they're in as much of a rebuild as people want to think. So give me the Raptors, a, a team that's not getting a lot of respect, to at least initiate the new campaign of their franchise. Let's go. I also think, too, we talk about season to season, positive versus negative regression. You have a team that goes so far under market expectations. And Toronto was oh, yeah. about 11 and a half games below their win total. 25 wins last year at a 36 and a half win total. You know, a lot of times with that, you would then see the next season. You know, you see the, the number really, really shaded to a degree that's probably too much. And that, that Toronto probably should be low, you know, low to mid 30s. Right. You should have obviously dropped from 36 and a half, but yeah, 29 and a half is, it is a little bit heavy and it does seem to be penalizing them maybe a bit too much for the fact they are in the same division of a Boston, New York and a Philadelphia. So no qualms with me uh, for me on that one, Chris, uh, the, the two win total bets for Chris will go warriors over 43 and a half Raptors over 29 and a half. Uh, my other one, I did, did stick in the West here and it's a team I really want to like, cause I, like I, I worked with the G league ignite the last couple seasons in Vegas as their team broadcaster got to know Scoot Henderson. He's an awesome kid. I love him. I'm, I really want him to succeed, but Portland man, 22 and a half. I'm, I can only go under here. This is one I played. It's a minus 120. There has been uh, some under money coming in. You can still find the 22 and a half though shaded. You got to pay a little extra juice for it. But when you're a team moving on from Damian Lillard and your young cornerstones are, Anthony Simons, 20, a 25-year-old, who is the third worst defender in points per 100 possessions allowed in the NBA last year. Shaden Sharp, who's 21, who only played 32 games with an abdominal injury, and he's already out with another injury. He's out at least three weeks with a, the second time he's had a shoulder labrum tear in his left shoulder. And then Scoot, who 
look, there's a lot of reasons to like him long term, but he's a project. He's an unbelievable athlete, but he's a point guard who can't protect the ball. He was the second worst in turnovers per 100 possessions last year and just really struggled shooting the ball. He, he shot at 35 percent outside the restricted area. I was the dead last as far as individuals and finishing at the rim a season ago. Those are the cornerstones of that team. They're in a loaded division. They went 1-15 in 15 against their division last year, by the way. And the vets that they have, you figure, will give them a lot of production. Jeremy Grant uh, could easily be on the trade block. And then DeAndre Ayton at center, who was great post-All-Star break, averaged a, a double-double at almost 23-13 and, and 13 last year. you got to think those guys will be on contenders. It, it, it's certainly Ayton. I would think Grant, even though he has a – He's on the second year of a five-year, $160 million contract. I, I have to think a team finds a way to make that contract work for them, Chris. So it's just a team I'm not excited about you know, in, in any way. And they have to start the year with a really tough gauntlet. First 13 games against the West. Specifically, they get Minnesota three times. So if you want to be on an overpace with that, you'd have to be four and nine. And I mean, that, that could easily be a one and 12, two and 11 sort of start for them. Uh, and there's just, for me... Not much reason to get excited about Portland to under 22 and a half. That was my favorite win total under for, for the teams that are going to be in the Cooper flag sweepstakes <laughs> uh, next summer. Yeah, uh, I, get, I mean, I, got, I don't have much to say about that. I completely agree with you. I'll put it this way. When you got a guy like DeAndre Ayton on your team who, you know, he, he stays at home when there's a nice storm. I mean, hey, I mean, I don't know what to say. You know, just like the motivation isn't there. It just seems like kind of the energy has left the room since Damian Lillard also left uh and you know you might have some fantasy opportunities on guys like anthony simons or jeremy grant throughout the season especially if there's a lot of other injuries on the team right if they're like the sole star at, at at that point but this portland trailblazers team is not a team that i can support at all and it sounds like if anyone out there does like the over you need to wait you know you need to wait until mid-november at least to you know wait until they lose the first 13 games right and then you kind of get behind that but uh, I think you sure wrapped thing. it up really well there, Ben. I, I, I can't support the, the Portland Trailblazers in, in any manner. Denny Avdi, I'd say, would be a good fan. You know, great, good stats, bad team yeah. guy. Love Avdi for fan, you know, fantasy player prop purposes this year coming over in the, in the trade from Washington. Uh, you know how, like, in football, the, Miami, the 72 Miami Dolphins, whenever that last undefeated team goes down, you know, they light a cigar. I, well, the worst franchise history uh, team record in Portland history was the 72 Blazers. So I'm sure somewhere Rick Adelman and Sidney Wicks, who that team went 18 and 64, you know, that, that's like a, you know, they, they are waiting for somebody to hopefully surpass <laughs> them. So it's like the reverse Dolphins yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> logic. This might be the year. Be the Portland year. finally uh, gets their, their level of infamy off the schneid. I don't yeah. know. Maybe, maybe somewhere Sidney Wicks and Rick Adelman are listening and they're just solemnly nodding their heads. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? I, 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 if there's any season where it can happen, it's this one. Because I, I do think that the West is as good as – I mean, it's as good as it has been sub the Clippers, right? I, I can't talk about the Clippers anymore as, as – you know, seriously anyway, at least for a little while. But, uh, sure yeah, the, the West is stacked. Their division is good. Goodbye, Portland. Absolutely. Unfortunately. We love Portland. <laughs> Just not as far as betting on the yeah. Blazers. Not, not their basketball team, that's all. Not the basketball team, yes. Uh, as far as the individual game, so we've covered a lot of our futures thoughts pretty much every week on, on this show, though. We'll be recording. You'll be able to hear these on Thursday uh, Thursday afternoons on the East Coast, which will be great because a lot of times you get the marquee Thursday night doubleheaders. We'll have full slates of Friday games. By that time, markets will be, uh, at least with look-ahead lines, will be out. We'll have some openers already posted. Uh, what's unique, Chris, at least for week one, is we've had lines out since August. So we've had a couple months here to kind of marinate. And at least for the two games on Tuesday, with the Knicks taking on Boston, Celtics about a five-point favorite there in the true opener, and then Minnesota taking on the Lakers. It's funny, we've seen one game already have a flip of favorites. Lakers were a soft one-point favorite in some shops over the summer. That is flipped now to Minnesota, too, and, and you believe that that move is certainly justified. Oh, yeah, certainly justified. The Lakers have started slow, like I said, uh, every season for the last few seasons. Um, and you look at the Minnesota Timberwolves and the way that they started their season last year. They're one of the hottest teams in the NBA. Their defense was stopping everybody. I believe they had uh, close to 30 wins, maybe north of that, by the end of December. Uh, 35 maybe, I think. But I'm, you know, stats aren't in front of me for that. But this is not a Lakers team that I can trust. I mean, let's start with J.J. Redick. J.J. Redick is a, a gifted commentator, I think. And he's, you know, I think he probably should have kept his career there. Maybe. Uh, maybe he's a good coach. I don't know. But when you compare this kind of program coming in with – LeBron James, it kind of feels a lot like the Jets and Aaron Rodgers, right? Like there's just, there's a lot of narratives. There's a lot of drama. Uh, obviously LeBron is playing with his son now and you got a Minnesota team 
who went as far, went further than a lot of people thought they would last year, all the way to the Western Finals. Didn't get it done, but you know, obviously they're coming back with vengeance on their mind. Uh, you have to love the Minnesota Timberwolves and the kind of depth that they have now. I think they won the better side of that trade. I mean, Dante DiVincenzo is fired up after leaving the New York Knicks. Like, I love seeing that from an NBA player. I mean, in the preseason, he's fired up. So, you know, I, seriously, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think he's a sixth man of the year candidate this year. Um, you know, all the depth is, is still there with this team. Obviously, Anthony Edwards stock just keeps on going up. And it's probably a good thing that Rudy Gobert doesn't really have to compete with another center anymore. I mean, the Twin Towers worked for a second there, but I don't think it was ever going to work long term. I'm not a Julius Randle guy, but I think he fits into this team perfectly because he doesn't have to be the star, right? He doesn't have to be the focus of it. Um, and I, I, I just love the way that Minnesota started last season. So if you're giving me Minnesota and any kind of short line against this Lakers team from the very beginning, I know it's a popular thing to fade the Lakers, but this is not just any old team, right? The Minnesota Timberwolves are on the up and up. Uh, so I, I love them in this opener. Yeah, look, good luck, J.J. Redick, fellow sports media member, but uh, now, yes, head coach of the Lakers. It's a little bit of a more of a different, you know, more of a different challenge if you're putting it that way. Um, yeah, kids, we would definitely expect more. Uh, we would get, definitely expect some more sentiment to come in on Minnesota as we get closer to tip off their uh, Tuesday nights in L.A. Again, that's Minnesota minus two right now across the board. And then on Wednesday, we've got 10 games. Pretty good slate there for Wednesday. You and I have a play on on the, the Buck 76ers game. I'm going side, Chris. You're looking total. Uh, this, for me, more just kind of an injury-based play here, and the market is in some disagreement right now. You can still get uh, Milwaukee plus three and a half, which is what I played uh, yesterday when the injury news was sort of confirmed there on Paul George, who has a bone bruise, hyperextended his knee in a preseason game against the Hawks. So that's not great. You get your $212 million max deal over four years, and you come to a franchise already dealing with an injured superstar perennially in Joel Embiid, and you're already banged up if you're Paul George. Uh, so this open four and a half. I, I thought in general, though, I mean, Milwaukee, if you're just talking general you know, market principles, Chris, this is like the classic buy low spot. I mean, they were the – the preseason NBA title favorites last year when they got Damian Lillard, it was a disaster in every way. Now you at least get a chance to reset. Nobody's really talking about you. You're the fourth favorite, like we mentioned, to come out of the East. Now down to 14-1 to 1 to win it all. First full season for Doc Rivers. And you're an old, fran a really old roster. So I would say playing on Milwaukee early is a really smart play because they will be at their healthiest. Sands Chris Middleton, who's still dealing with ankle injuries from uh, really from last uh, late stretch of the season a year ago. So it's a play on anyway for me on Milwaukee. Now you add in injury issues for Philadelphia. And uh, this, mar this mark is kind of all over the place. A couple shops down to two and a half. I just tried to jump in front of this move. I could easily see a situation where like a George gets ruled out and this becomes like a pick em or something. Uh, and even if it goes back up to four and a half, if he's ruled in, I'm not too worried about the Bucks side here, at least for opening night. Yeah, I got to say, at first I didn't like the Damian Lillard uh you know trade coming over to the bucks uh and and i'm still not too sure about it but very interesting roster this year you know when you bring in a guy like gary trent jr i i think he could just be a really solidifying piece for that offense you know a veteran uh you know he's been with championship teams before kind of you know he can he can take the helm when damian lillard is not uh and once they get chris middleton back this is as good of a starting five as you can have in the nba especially as far as the continuity goes with some of these guys now, too, right? Brooke Lopez has been there for a long time. He had a phenomenal season last year, one of the best defensive players in the NBA, but also, you know, really kind of rose up on offense for them. And, you know, the depth is still there for this team across, too. And you look at a team like the 76ers, who had very high expectations last year, too, as the season was going along. But again, I don't like the Paul George addition. They got a lot of scores out there, but this is not a team who who plays to win early. You know, you know, the, the, it's kind of how the Bucks are, too, and it's why I like the over in this game. That's going to be the side that I take. Uh, last year, this was the opener, too. Almost hit 240 in their opener. And just two teams who who famously like don't play a lot of defense early in these seasons, especially the Bucks. But we kind of see it a little bit with the 76ers, too, as they try to conserve Joel Embiid throughout the season. So I, I just think they're going to put on a show in this one. I think the pace is going to be very high. I think if Paul George is out of this game, that increases the pace, too. Um, and, you know, they just have a lot of small ball guys now on both teams that can really run the floor. I mean, Tyrese Maxey is going to do that every single game for you. But when sure. you're adding Gary Trent Jr., um, along with Damian Lillard, uh, I mean, that's going to be a high-scoring team all year for the Bucks too. So give me the over in this one, but I strongly lean to the Bucks on your side too, Ben. 
Yeah, let's go. 225 market consensus there. Bucks, Sixers to the over. Well, by the way, once the postseason starts, Gary Trent Jr., of the top 10 in the Bucks projected rotation, he'll be the only guy who hasn't turned 30 yet. Like, so how often do you see that yeah, in an yeah, wow. NBA roster? And he's been around. He's been around, too. Yeah. Yeah, yes, he has. Uh, as far as the other remaining games, we'll hit these quickly here to wrap up the show. You've got a couple other plays, Chris, for the Wednesday card. Uh, a couple of really intriguing matchups, too, to start off in, in the division. First off, in Detroit, uh, Pistons getting some buzz here in the win total markets to the over. Uh, but Indiana coming off an outstanding run to the Eastern Conference Finals. They are laying five and a half there in the Motor City. Yeah, you know, it's hard to take Indiana right from the very beginning. And I'm sure that J.B. Bicker's staff is, is going to improve this team in Detroit over time. But they just didn't do enough to change their roster. I don't really believe in this roster. They got some interesting pieces over there, but um, you know, give me the Pacers who are going to run the floor as fast as any team in the NBA. I don't see that stopping. Uh, you know, they're they're going to explode, right? They're going to explode right out the gates. That's what they do. They're predicated on their offense. And five and a half, you can argue, even on the road, is a very short line for a team who looked very good last year as as a real threat in the East. So now they come with that experience. They come with, right, all that. I mean, they kind of turn into veterans, right? Like you turn wise over a season when you go through that. The Detroit Pistons are just not even close yet. And talk about a team that's in transition and still growing and building. Uh, I think we're just going to see that right from the very start. Again, five and a half. Like if this is midseason, I think this is an eight and a half. And and I'm not going to look at it any differently just because it's the very start. Hey, you're, you're having to pay a premium, too, on Detroit, who, it, which is weird to say for a team with the lowest win total in their division – but very, very popular bet. They opened 22 and a half. That's been bet up to 25 and a half, win total wise. And the market has kind of had to correlate and adjust as far as the game one price there. Uh, so, yeah, you make a good point. Five and a half for Indiana. Also, too, and it's the high totals with Indiana. I mean, I kind of feel like with them, those points become a little bit less valuable when you talk about taking an underdog when there is such high variance. Uh, so, Indiana laying five and a half. Another bet here for Chris. And then we'll wrap it up with yet another divisional game. Uh, Heat culture. Gets their season underway against Orlando. Magic finally usurped Miami in the divisional race last year. Uh, kind of a fascinating handicap a game to start, though, Chris. One and a half in favor of Miami. Lowest total on the board at 210 of any game we'll see on opening night. Yeah, you know, this is a Heat team that has done well against the Magic in the past. They beat them three out of four times last season. And they're finally healthy, right? Especially Jimmy Butler. And I know Jimmy Butler has said that he doesn't really care about the regular season. Well, I think you're going to have to start to care a little bit more about the regular season, Jimmy, because you're going to want to put your team in the Eastern Conference in a much better position come playoff time or else it's going to be a really, really tough road to get there. But, you know, I, again, I think they drafted really, really well. Uh, they got a center, Khalil Ware, who I think has a lot of potential for this team when Bam Adebayo comes off the court. Um, I like their depth pieces still, and I think they got even better. You know, guys like Kevin Rugg, um, excuse me, Kevin Love, and Duncan Robinson are, are going to be where they're going to be, but they've been there for a long time, right? And Terry Rozier, who I did not like coming to the Heat, he was really good. I mean, he fit right into that Heat, heat culture, like a blue-collar mentality. Um, and then you got Jaime Yaquas Jr., who I just think is going to get better and better too. I like this Orlando team. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the Orlando Magic are a growing team as well. They impressed last year, but we kind of saw them come back down to earth at the end of last season, you know, as, as other teams were racing towards the playoffs. And I don't think the Heat are going to start as slow as we've seen in seasons past. That has hurt them, right? And Eric Spolstra is still one of the top coaches in the NBA. is going to have that defense going. I think the total is around 210 in this one, if I'm not mistaken, Ben. I do like them yeah. in this one, too. But these two teams went over quite a few times last season, at least over this number. So I'm not jumping on that that quickly, but I do like the Heat in this one and another short line. Yeah, if you're wondering why it's so low, I mean, these two teams in general were just dead under teams, two of the best under teams in the league. And as a result, you will have to play. It's almost like a pseudo uh, playoff sort of premium there as far yeah. as the, the total you're playing now that we're into the, the 210 range. But yeah, new role for Orlando. I mean, minus 160 to win the division. This is a team that was 37 and a half on the win total coming into last year. You just you kind of wonder, right? Y young team, a lot of enticing pieces. But how do they look now that they are they are moving to that role of favorites? It's all, it's kind of like the like the same Jacksonville Jaguars logic, you know, to borrow your your NFL discussion going back a couple of years. Come, come out of nowhere, you know, win the division, look great, everybody's on them, and then they fall flat on their faces as, as division favorites the, the next season. I will see if Orlando can avoid a similar fate as their uh, their fellow Florida brethren. Uh, just to the northeast. But to recap, our best for our best bets here for week one on the single games, Chris Farley, Timberwolves minus two opening night on the road against the Lakers. 
That's on Tuesday night. Then on Wednesday, it's the Pacers minus five and a half on the road over the Pistons. Heat minus one and a half at home against the Magic and Bucks 76ers over 225. Again, I'm also on, uh, for me, best bet, Bucks plus three and a half. You can still find that. That is uh, widely available. DraftKings, uh, the leading book that has that available right now, Bucks plus three and a half over the 76ers. Chris, pumped to be with you, man, all season long. This is going to be a blast. This is just the start uh, of, of a long NBA campaign. A lot of twists and turns here to come. Uh, so really looking forward to it, man. Tell everybody, too, as I know you have a lot of different uh, places that you are. Uh, you're providing content this year. You do write-ups as well. Where can people check you out? Yeah, you check me out at sportmoney.com at PixWise, which I believe is another U.K. company. Got a lot of affiliations with the U.K. over here. Which there I we love. go. Yeah, I love love working with Sportsbet.io. I love working with you now, Ben. I'll just say this. I'll end it like this. At Farley Bets on X, you can follow me. The NBA is tough. There's a lot of injuries that come up last minute. The NFL is going on. It's still the World Series. You still got college football. Just take it easy with the NBA early if you're betting on it. You know, you don't have to invest in all these teams right away. Kind of see who they are and kind of how they're performing together because it is a long, long season. And you see a lot of changes in the way teams are now and then the way that they come out in like February, March. Chris Farley, pro better, also betting therapist as well to many. <laughs> that's I mean, right. that's just what, what a great way to lay <laughs> right. it out for everybody. Uh, he, he's Chris. I'm Ben Wilson. You can follow me at Ben underscore Wilson underscore one as well. Uh, shout out to uh, our producer, Will Pattinson, doing a great work behind the scenes as always. We'll be back. You can see our fresh episodes every Thursday throughout the entire regular season of the NBA. We'll break down the big marquee Thursday night games as well as the best games that we uh, will be looking to bet on the Friday card as well. Uh, so for Chris, I'm Ben. We'll catch you next time here. Uh, appreciate you tuning into our first episode of the weekly NBA show from sportsbet.io. See you next time.